We might not like to brag, but Canadians are used to making history. We are an example for the rest of the world. No matter what the circumstances, we roll up our sleeves and we pitch in. When no one else could do it, Canadian troops drove the Germans from their trenches in World War I. Whenever they need the toughest fighting done, they bring in the Canadians. During the darkest days of the Battle of Britain, Canada kept England in the fight against Hitler. Everything we care about was at stake. If Britain had fallen, it would have been the end of democracy. Canada helped end the last world war, then made sure the next one didn't break out. Lester Pearson effectively kept nuclear conflict off the table. This was the closest we had come to World War III. It would have been game over for the human race. Canadians really don't understand how much of a contribution we've had to the world throughout history. With Canada's assistance, the Americans got to the moon and then back again in one piece. And something without a doubt that needs to be celebrated. But to see just how big an impact we've had on world history, we're about to launch a thought experiment. We're going to take Canada away. We'll learn how Canada helped create the modern world and discover how unrecognizable history and the planet would be without our many contributions. We would not have the free world as we know it today. It would be an inhumane, barbaric system. It's almost unbearable to think about. If we don't have a Canada, we don't have a world. This is the world without Canada. The place we now call Canada has been around a long time, and our history has seen many changes. Over its 150-year history, Canada has had a significant impact on global events. But I think that the first time it really plays a major role in geopolitics begins in 1914. World War I was really when Canada emerged on the world stage. As fighting breaks out between Britain and Germany in 1914, Canada's role is all but guaranteed. Canada gets involved because, frankly, it has no choice. It is part of the British Empire. While a country in name, Canada still can't control its destiny. But that is about to change. The first time that Canada makes an appearance on the battlefield in any major way is at the Second Battle of Ypres, which is the first time that gas is used in significant amounts on the Western Front. Belgium, 1915. Desperate to break the stalemate of trench warfare, the Germans send a wall of deadly chlorine gas towards the Allied lines. Gas effectively liquefies your lungs. It's a, it's a horrible way to die. In its path, one of the great unsung heroes of the war. At just over four feet six inches tall, George Naismith is considered too short to fight with the army. But by 1915, he's already saved more people than any war hero. A chemist from Toronto, Naismith was no stranger to chlorine. Ten years earlier, he'd made history with it when he added it to Toronto's drinking water for the first time. It ended a deadly typhoid outbreak and saved thousands of lives. It also set a precedent soon, followed by cities all over North America. Brought to France to protect the Allies' water supply, Naismith immediately recognized the gas as chlorine. Knowing ammonia could turn the gas into less lethal crystals, his orders to the men around him were simple. Urinate on your handkerchiefs and wrap them around your faces. Those who could survived. Within hours, he'd made a rudimentary gas mask with conventional materials that would spare countless soldiers from falling victim to gas. It was cruel, it was inhuman, and it needed a defense. Canada provided that defense. It also served as a crucial stopgap until a better mask designed by Clooney McPherson, a doctor from St. John's, Newfoundland, hit the lines. The gas mask was a Canadian invention and it made it possible for World War I not to be an easy victory for the belligerents. But that's not the only impact Canada has had on the battlefield at Ypres. Despite the gas, the untested Canadians hold the line blunting an assault that could have ended the stalemate on the Western Front, which could have won the war for the Germans. Canadian troops showed courage and bravery that was truly impressive. But victory didn't come cheap. 2,000 Canadians will be buried under the poppies 
which Guelph's John McRae will immortalize just days later in his poem, In Flanders Fields. That battle really underscores the horrors of war. Emerging from this baptism of fire was a man who would soon become a legend, Francis Pegamagabo. Although the government excluded Aboriginal peoples from the army in 1914, somehow he managed to enlist and was one of the first Canadians to arrive on the killing fields of France. There, he distinguished himself as one of Canada's most daring scouts and lethal marksmen. Often operating alone deep within no man's land, it is believed he took out over 370 enemy soldiers and captured 300 more. With the help of fearless soldiers like Pegamagabo, the Canadians quickly earn a reputation as some of the hardest fighting soldiers on the Western Front. Their reward, tougher assignments. There was something about the Canadian spirit that allowed them to adapt quickly. They've been able to develop new ways of fighting, and now they're bringing it to the forefront. Then, in the spring of 1917, they're given their hardest mission yet, Vimy Ridge, a heavily fortified piece of high ground that anchored a key section of the German line. 100,000 Allied soldiers had been killed or wounded trying to take it. This is the first time the Canadians fight together as a Canadian Corps. Following weeks of meticulous planning and extensive training, the Canadians strike. The fight is brutal. Almost 3,600 Canadians are cut down. But when the smoke clears, the ridge has been taken. For Canadians, it's the greatest moment in our history. This was the first time that we had been able to accomplish something that nobody had been able to do before, which was push the Germans off this impregnable ridge. Canada entered World War I a, a colony and came out a nation of the world. It's one in a long line of stunning victories for the Canadian Corps, who by now have earned the respect of the British High Command. Whenever they need a breakthrough, whenever they need the toughest fighting done, they bring in the Canadians. By the summer of 1918, the Canadian Army is being used as the shock troops of the British Empire. By this time, they're one of the finest fighting forces in the world. They have been able to harness a combined arms approach using air, using artillery, engineers, infantry, all together to provide not only a breakthrough of the German lines, which hadn't been seen in years, but also provide the momentum to be able to push the Germans back until they finally surrendered in November. With Canada's help, the war is finally won. The outcome of that war was very significantly shifted because of the Canadian involvement. It's something all Canadians need to remember and be proud of. But what would have happened if Canada hadn't been there? If there's no Canada, there is going to be a massive repercussion. Great Britain is in trouble and so are the Allies. No Canada means no shock troops to storm Vimy and help drive the Germans from their lines in the fall of 1918. And without the knockout blow provided by Canada's troops, it's possible the Germans remain in their trenches, and the war drags on and on. The more the war goes on, war weariness is gonna set in. There's a drag on society, a drag on the economy, and it ends up leaving the world susceptible to new ideologies. In this world of never-ending war and death, the communist promise of peace, land and bread could quickly find some new converts. If Canada hadn't helped decisively and quickly conclude World War I, communist power coming out of Russia could have continued to move into Western Europe. I think once the juggernaut of communism starts to go in our scenario, I don't think you can slow it down. If Great Britain goes communist, then you would expect France and the rest of Western Europe to follow suit. We know what communism is. We know what communism does, why we fear it. It has to do with freedom and liberty. Every communist government that has endured has endured by invoking censorship and control over the people. Under the communist regime, you were constantly worried about what you said or what you did. If something was an affront to the government, you were sent away to a work camp. Even something as innocent as a foreign magazine could get you arrested. No! We would probably all likely be under communist rule if World War I had gone differently. No Canada in the trenches of the Western Front might have remade the world as we know it. 
but its absence in the next war will have even more dire consequences for the planet. To discover the impact that Canada has had upon history, we've launched a thought experiment. Imagine what the world would be like if Canada's contribution to history was simply erased. No Canada on the Western Front would have remade the world we've come to know. No! But what would have happened if Canada wasn't there for the most important event of the 20th century? Second World War took more lives than any other conflict we have ever seen and perhaps brought about more dramatic changes culturally, politically, scientifically, ideologically than any other single event in history. And once again, Canada is in the thick of the action. Canada's role in the Second World War is absolutely pivotal. 1939, following Adolf Hitler's invasion of Poland, Britain and France declare war on Nazi Germany. In 1939, Adolf Hitler was the greatest threat to the West, to democracy. Everything we care about was at stake. But they wouldn't face the Nazis alone. In 1939, we declared war a week after Great Britain declared war. It marks a huge point that we, as a country, our own government, declared war for ourselves for the first time. But following France's shocking defeat in 1940, Hitler turns the full might of Nazi Germany on Britain. As Hitler's Luftwaffe tries to pound England into submission, the crucial thing keeping the British in the fight are convoys sailing from Canada. That lifeline becomes everything. They need to eat. They need to be able to find fuel. And if they don't have these basic necessities, they will be forced to surrender. And that's exactly what Hitler was attempting to do in 1940 and 41. Hitler's U-boat fleet the most highly trained and well-equipped arm of his military is ordered into the Atlantic to sever that lifeline. In its way, thousands of raw Canadian recruits sent to protect the convoys. Sailing on ships designed for coastal whaling, they plunge deep into the dark heart of the Atlantic. It's a hazardous job. It's just a horrendous challenge, but Canada steps up. Hitler's wolf packs are relentless. In June 1941 alone, they sink more than 500,000 tons of cargo. To save Britain, the Navy would need to find the U-boats first. Having a technology that enables you to locate them beneath the surface is absolutely paramount. A key Canadian invention will help the Allies do just that. In 1912, a Canadian engineer, Reginald Fessenden, invented a system for detecting objects underwater with sound waves. It laid the groundwork for what would soon become sonar. Sonar is one of the greatest developments in the history of naval warfare. We invented the technology that gave us eyes and ears beneath the waves, and that was crucial to the Allies. Along with long-range bombers and the cracking of the Nazi codes, sonar helps the Allies finally turn the tide in the Battle of the Atlantic. In recognition of Canada's contributions, the entire Northwest Atlantic was put under the control of Rear Admiral Leonard Murray, making him the first Canadian to command an Allied theater of war. By the end of 1944, the Wolf Pack's menace has been put down, and Britain's crucial lifeline has been saved. But in a world without Canada, could Britain have survived? Canada was instrumental in keeping supplies moving across the Atlantic to Britain. If we had not been there to help in that effort, Britain might well have been starved. It was under siege. It was being bombed. It might well have been captured or fallen to the enemy hands. Superiority in the skies was crucial to winning the war. And here, too, Canada played a key role. The idea send young men from all parts of the empire to Canada for Air Force training. Canada became the empire's reservoir for trained airmen. With Britain too vulnerable to German air attacks, Canada took responsibility for the Commonwealth Air Training Program. Men from all over the world, Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, were trained at 151 bases quickly constructed across Canada. In all, Canada instructed nearly half the flight crews that served with British forces during World War II. Canadians bring a special approach to aviation technology. 
Vancouver-born Elsie McGill, the world's first female aeronautical engineer, was an integral part of Canada's support. As chief engineer for Canadian Car and Foundry, she helped design and manage the Canadian production of Hawker Hurricane fighter aircraft for the Allies. Not only a war hero, early in her life she overcame odds and learned to walk again after contracting polio. A role model for women in engineering, she even became the subject of a comic book, Queen of the Hurricanes. McGill's story is truly one to inspire. On the battlefield, the Allies needed to break Hitler's stranglehold on Western Europe. In 1943, Canada assisted her allies with preparations for an assault on the Normandy coast. D-Day would become the largest seaborne invasion in history. With over 5,000 ships and 155,000 soldiers. There are no easy victories in war, but Canada's contribution fundamentally was, was about being involved in those hard victories and not shying away from that. Canadian forces were responsible for taking Juneau Beach when the invasion of France finally happened in June 1944. At first, the Canadians took heavy casualties, but when the landing was over, they pushed further inland than any other Allied force on D-Day. From there, they pushed deep into Europe, freeing the Dutch from Nazi occupation along the way. By May 1945, the war in Europe was over, in no small measure because of the ingenuity, bravery, and sacrifice of Canadians. But what would have happened if Canada's contribution to winning World War II was wiped from the history books? Canada was a decisive and brave participant in the Battle of the Atlantic. Take Canada out of that part of the equation and Britain could fall before the United States has a chance to gear up and come in and save it. If that battle had been lost, it's quite conceivable that Great Britain might have fallen to the Nazi powers in World War II. Without Canada's key contributions during the war's most desperate hours, the world might look very, very different. Had Britain fallen, suddenly you'd be faced with a condition very much like a Cold War, where you would have uh, a Europe that is completely Nazi occupied and no longer troubled by a Western front. For people living under the fascist boot in England, you would see essentially a police state. It would be tightly run. There would be no such thing as the British Parliament. They would have rounded up politicians. I'm sure they would have put Churchill in prison. They would have shut down presses. They would have inserted themselves into every aspect of life. Focus. British school children would have grown up learning about the glories of Nazi history. Kids would end their day in class saying, Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. It's almost unbearable to think about how grim it would have been. But these images pale in comparison to what the post-war world could look like without Canada. The end of the Second World War marks the beginning of the Cold War, an era of clashing superpowers and failed diplomacy. And without Canada around to broker the peace, the fate of the entire planet is about to be jeopardized. If there's no Canada, then the world is without a doubt on track for World War III. It would be game over for the human race. Canadians proved themselves invaluable on and off the battlefield during pivotal moments in World War I and II. In the world without Canada, the loss of these contributions turned the globe upside down. When we reset, Canada again finds itself at the center of a game-changing global crisis. We have now moved into the atomic and the thermonuclear age. The stakes are higher and more dramatic than they've ever been in human history. Here it is just 11 years after the end of World War II, and it looks like World War III may begin. One of the most important moments of the Cold War is the 1956 Suez Crisis, when Egypt nationalizes the very crucial Suez Canal. That was like sticking a dagger at Britain's throat. British oil flowed through that canal. British commerce flowed through that canal. It's an issue of interrupting world trade. This is the Cold War's first nuclear showdown, the final days of October 1956. Britain, France, and Israel conduct a military invasion of Suez. 
On November 5th, Russia sent a diplomatic telegram to Britain, France, and Israel. It more or less implied that Russia would be willing to use nuclear weapons to take Britain down. America steps in to back the United Kingdom. Eisenhower reportedly said, if the Soviets hit Britain, we're going to have to hit them back with, quote, everything in the bucket. The world seems to be ramping up the way it did at the beginning of World War I. So it was absolutely crucial to find a mechanism to be able to defuse that before war could come again. And that's where Canada comes in. Canada's Secretary of State for External Affairs, Lester B. Pearson, approached the UN. The concept that he comes up with, along with Dag Hammarskjöld, the head of the United Nations, is to provide a new framework for thinking. Pearson proposed a United Nations Emergency Force, a group better known today as peacekeepers. He gave the UN a tool to defuse the crisis, and he gave the British and the French an honorable exit route. The Secretary General will submit to it within 48 hours a plan for the setting up with the consent of the nation's concern of an emergency international United Nations force. We go in there and say, cool it, guys. Both sides back off. We're going to make sure you don't kill each other. A Canadian invention and one that saved the world. And I don't know if there was anyone else in the world who could have pulled us off. Pearson was so well connected. He was so well respected. Nevertheless, Egypt refused to let Canadians be part of the first peacekeeping force. Egypt took issue with the Canadian uniforms, which mimicked those of the British troops invading the Middle East. The Union Jack was still present on Canada's flag and on the arm of each Canadian soldier. Our greatest diplomat was also a warrior. He wanted Canada to be able to deliver. Pearson fought back and convinced the UN that Canada should be part of that initial mission, which was led by Montreal-born Lieutenant General ELM Burns. The newly established UN peacekeeping force successfully de-escalated the situation and solidified the position of the UN. To give you a sense of just how important Pearson's achievement was, the following year he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. We owe him, not just Canada, we, homo sapiens, owe him an enormous debt of gratitude. He, more than any other figure of the 20th century, is the reason why we're here in the 21st. But the issue that almost kept Canadians from doing their part didn't escape Pearson. Years later, when he became Prime Minister, Pearson had a new mission. He changed Canada's flag to one that Canadian soldiers and peacekeepers could wear on their shoulder in any situation. One that represented a Canada that had truly come into its own. The new flag was raised on February 15, 1965. The story of Lester Pearson is the story of Canada in the world. Canada becomes known as a nation that can be called upon under the confines of the, the United Nations to send its people, to send its blue helmets uh, around the world to help keep the peace. But in the world without Canada, during the Suez Crisis, Pearson isn't there to promote his game-changing idea. What are the consequences of a world without peacekeepers? The big challenge with history is understanding that every single event can have a knockoff to it. In other words, there's always a consequence. The very concept of peacekeeping doesn't exist. It's not a question of not having Canadians in blue helmets, but not having blue helmets at all. It would have demonstrated to the world that there was no possibility of an international body ever having any meaningful role in settling territorial disputes. International relations might be the least of our worries. If there's no Canada and no Lester B. Pearson, then the world is without a doubt on track for World War III. The Soviets only had about 200 bombs. The Americans had two and a half thousand bombs. It's entirely possible that these weapons might have seemed like a good idea. The very least of the impacts that would have been devastating environmental effects that we would probably still be living with today the same sort of damage that we would have seen with Chernobyl and radiation on the wind, uh, dead areas that no one could go into. If there was a nuclear war, the amount of dust kicked up into the atmosphere would block out about 90% of the sun's rays and cool the Earth's temperature. Any crops, any people, any animals that were there will either die or have offspring that is genetically compromised. The long-term effects of radiation is basically the destruction of a species genetically. Game over for the human race. 
The world without Canada's involvement in the Suez crisis is a devastating place. Without Canada's continued role in peacekeeping and humanitarian efforts, things aren't looking up. The world without Canada's presence at pivotal moments in history looks bleak. Pearson's commitment and ingenuity toward international peace may have prevented another world conflict. Pearson's legacy goes beyond the Suez crisis, however. It sculpts our Canadian identity. How we act in the world, how we see ourselves, how we think we should act, all comes from Lester Pearson's shaping our foreign policy after the Second World War. Part of this developing reputation is that Canada now becomes a safe haven. This is perhaps one of the most beautiful things that Canada offers to the world. I love being Canadian. I'm always proud to say that I'm Canadian specifically for the way that we've championed human rights. One of the ways Canada has contributed is taking in refugees. I am the daughter of a refugee. I have lots of family members who are refugees from uh, Hungary. We took in, over the course of 1956 to 1957, 38,000 people from the communist country of Hungary. I often look at that refugee reception movement as a real watershed period in Canadian history. To help integrate refugees, Canada created a private sponsorship program. Canadians were enthusiastic about hosting these refugees and making them into Canadians. Whether it be from Hungary, whether it be from Cambodia, whether it be recently from Syria, this is what Canada is about, offering safe haven. A neat side story about that is that large numbers of Hungarian refugees took in Indonesian refugees in the late 1970s, which is a nice full circle example of one group of new Canadians helping another group of new Canadians. Over Canada's history, hundreds of thousands of individuals seeking refuge have found a home within its borders. This intersection of diverse peoples has laid the foundation for a unique world outlook. And this legacy begins well before World War II. We do have a complicated history of, of refugee reception. That's important to acknowledge. But what we have done when we do take in uh, people escaping persecution, we have done that well. For example, the United Empire Loyalists, Irish famine migrants in the early 1800s, large numbers of escaped slaves from the Underground Railroad who came via assistance or on their own, came to Canada looking for freedom and a better life. Canada's built on newcomers, almost by definition. And within Canada, multiculturalism has been present for a long time. In the mid-1700s, French, English, and First Nations languages and cultures were prominent north of the 49th parallel. Multiculturalism is a big part of our identity as a nation. Pierre Elliott Trudeau did many different things uh, while he was Prime Minister of Canada, and one of them was to make sure that everyone had the opportunity to become bilingual, and that multiculturalism was something to be celebrated and not something to be shunned. In 1971, Canada was the first country in the world to adopt multiculturalism as an official policy. Deciding that our strength is diversity, not uniformity, has been the template throughout the world, and we owe it to the Canadian example. In 1982, it was written into Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It speaks to the kind of country that we are with our approach to multiple identities. What makes a Canadian is from a variety of different perspectives. The idea that we would be a nation that would not only be a nation of immigrants, but be a nation that embraces immigrants. Share your culture, share your pride, share your cuisine. Don't give up who you were. It's a charter that has had an impact beyond Canada's borders. I was very lucky to meet Nelson Mandela not once, but twice. He pointed out to me that it was the Canadian Constitution that inspired the new South African Constitution, but it was particularly special because it came from such an incredible person. A hero of mine believed that Canada was heroic. The Charter has provided an example for countries looking to unite their diverse populations and promote peace and acceptance. When you look at places like South Africa, there are so many differences. It's not just two major languages. Zoza, for example, is 21 different languages. How can you begin to connect unless your constitution actually reflects all of these differences, but also reinforces that you're all part 
part of something larger. So Canada really does reflect those ideals, not just for Canadians, but for the world. The actions of an entire nation can be inspiring. So too are the actions of individuals. During the Great Depression, many found inspiration in an unlikely place, one dreamt up by a Canadian artist. Superman was invented by a Canadian, by Joe Shuster, along with an American writer, Jerry Siegel. Whether it's Superman or any of the other superheroes that have come since, as Canadians, we should be so proud that we created what is the 20th and the 21st century's world mythology. Schuster, originally from Toronto and Siegel, conceived Superman in the 1930s. The Man of Steel was the world's first superhero comic. Superheroes became role models. What's great about superheroes is that they are universal. So there's always this sense of wanting to do something that is greater than self, the hero's journey, that's at the core of these stories. Talk about people who fight bullying, they're superheroes. We talk about our men and women in uniform, they're superheroes. Outside the realm of science fiction, Canadians have proven themselves heroes time and time again. You can stand up, everybody can stand up, everybody can leap tall buildings in their own way and make the world a better place. From the arts to the political stage, Canadians have inspired others worldwide. I think one of the most difficult points of trying to come to terms with Canada is our own attitude. We are extremely modest. We prefer to let our actions speak for themselves. So. What if we removed Canada's humanitarian actions after World War II? What would happen to those first European refugees? Had there been a world without Canada in that particular instance, we would have seen, perhaps, a world with a continuation of that kind of conflict that we saw in World War II. Where would they have gone? They would have stayed in Europe, and many of the problems that arose over the course of the early 20th century would have remained unchecked in 1950s Europe. What would the world look like if Canada's policies toward refugees and multiculturalism weren't there? Canada is known around the world for its humanitarian efforts. And if we were to take that away, I think that it would be like removing a mentor. I am a woman. I'm incredibly outspoken. I do not look or sound like the majority. And I have something to say and will not be silenced. If we didn't have these ideas of multiculturalism and openness, people like me would be in trouble. Without Canadian humanitarian efforts, people all around the world are affected. Humanity will face an even bigger crisis when Canada's contributions beyond our planet disappear. Each look at the world without Canada has shown the incredible impact Canadians have had on the world stage. Canada is a defender of borders and human rights. Some battles, however, have been fought where there are no borders. Some of Canada's contributions have helped politics move beyond our planet. The greatest achievement of humankind in the 20th century was to go into space and look back at the Earth. And Canada played a huge part in making that happen. The space race started in 1957, August 4th, when the Soviet Union put the first man-made artificial object into orbit, the Sputnik 1. The United States responded by realizing they had let the ball drop and entered into a race. Canada had been working on a project of its own. By the end of the 1950s, we find ourselves in a position of building one of the world's most advanced jet fighters, which contained innovations that to this day still stand the test of time. The Avro Arrow was going to be the world's fastest and most advanced interceptor. For a brief shining moment, we were cutting edge in aerospace engineering. We had the Avro Arrow, and all Canadians you know, swell with a little bit of pride when we think about that. Unveiled the same day as Sputnik, the Canadian government soon felt the technology obsolete. The new battleground was the race for space. The fact that the plane was abandoned by the government of the day is regarded as a tragedy. But the flip side of that tragedy is that thousands of people, experts, specialists, engineers, scientists, with a unique knowledge 
of aviation technology were suddenly cast to the four winds. Many of Canada's best and brightest joined NASA just as the space race was heating up. 1961, Rice University, John F. Kennedy says, We choose to go to the moon, and it will be done before the end of this decade. Seeing Kennedy, President Kennedy, on television completely inspired not just the country, but the world. It's 237,000 miles to the moon, and you got to do the round trip and come on back. NASA cannot afford to screw up. How are you going to accomplish this? And the answer that a Canadian came up with was lunar orbit rendezvous. Canadian Jim Chamberlain started working on the Avro Aero project, but when it was scrapped, he went to work for NASA on the Lunar Lander program. He suggested separating a lander from the lunar orbiter. Canadians championed the method that would get the Apollo crew to the moon and home safely. What actually touched the lunar surface first certainly wasn't Neil's boot when he said one small step for man. It was the Canadian landing gear made by the Quebec company, Haru DevTech. Canadian technology is the first thing that touched the moon. And Canadians were present one year later when Apollo 13 was in distress. Okay, uh, we've had a problem here. Apollo 13 had its explosion, onboard explosion, and three lives were in danger. The solution was found in large measure at the University of Toronto. On April 16th, 1970, a team of scientists at U of T's Institute for Aerospace Studies received a call from Houston asking them for help with re-entry calculations. They had only four hours to come up with the answer that would help save the crew. Outside the Apollo missions, Canada Space Research focused on specific fields. We have to specialize, and we chose to specialize in robotics. The remote manipulating system, the Canadarm and Canadarm 2, is the muscle of the space program. It allows us to do the things that astronauts would do in space without actually putting astronauts there. Before robotics, however, we specialized in satellites. The Alouette 1 satellite, our satellite, Canada was the first nation to go for entirely peaceful purposes. We weren't trying to dominate or show military superiority. We weren't trying to win a Cold War. We wanted to do better science. We wanted to provide better telecommunication. Canada was pivotal in making space a human rather than a national endeavor. And this was key to our very survival as a species. The importance of the space race in the end wasn't global dominion, but one of vision. From space, there are no national borders. We can see the bigger picture. Everything we know these days about our planet ironically comes from finally getting to take a step away from it, being able to look at it from a distance. That distance allows us to see something new, and that inspires us and makes us want to look closer. Canada emerged on the scene at the very beginning and saying it isn't about you two, it's about everybody on Earth and it's about science. We put the template that humanity's future for all of us is in space on the table. In 1984, NASA satellites discovered how big the ozone hole over the Antarctic really was. The first definitive visual proof that there was a real problem up in the atmosphere and it really gathered the public support. Images of the planet from space helped save life on Earth. The response from governments around the world was to reduce the use of CFCs and eventually ban them completely. Our way of life was in existential threat. Satellites saved humanity. But what if things had been different? What would the world without Canada's presence in the history of space exploration, our contributions to NASA and scientific research look like? the exploration of space, gone with the 1960s, if it hadn't been for Canada. Without Canada's contributions to NASA's programs, they never would have reached the moon. The building of the International Space Station never would have occurred. There would be no high frontier being explored. NASA might have fallen apart in the early 1960s. NASA gave us a view of the Earth that changed our trajectory. Imagine the world if we hadn't been able to see the damage humans had caused. 
CFCs and other chemicals we were putting in the atmosphere were breaking down the ozone layer. We hadn't gotten that proof that what we were doing was ruinous. Our crops would be devastated. We would not be able to feed the world. We would be fighting a constant rear guard action against rampant skin cancer. We needed this shield and it was falling apart. We didn't even know it was falling apart. Without satellites, we never would have discovered that. We would be living in a dystopian world. From drastic changes in the dominant political powers, to environmental destruction, to nuclear war, the world without Canada's involvement at turning points in history could have been unrecognizable. Over the last hour, our thought experiment has given us a glimpse of the world without Canada during pivotal moments in history. Each scenario, from political regime shifts through to extinction, vastly alters the world as we know it. Canada, who needs it? The answer is the world needs Canada. It's definitely the sum of all the deeds that we have accomplished over the years that make us who we are and put us on the world stage. And Canadians remain on the world stage. Canada is a wonderful place. I've met Canadians all over the world, and everywhere I go, I feel like Canadians are impacting the world. All over the world, there are United Nations peacekeeping forces, Canadian invention, many Canadian men and women participating in them. We set an example. Within our own institutions, we try to lead by this example. On est vraiment un exemple au monde entier. Minister of Immigration, Ahmed Hussein came from Somalia at age 16. Adrian Clarkson and Mikhail Jean, who were each appointed Governor General, Canada's official head of state, were also once refugees. Certainly from what we've seen with the recent Syrian crisis, Canada continues to be a safe haven and open its arms for those people in conflict. A world with Canada is a world that wants to be a better place and wants to start here. For all our flaws, for all the dark moments in our history, we have always tried to create a greater common ground. We have always tried to create a country that is more generous, um, that is more inclusive. And Canadians themselves inspire the world in many ways. Canada's current Federal Minister of Transportation is an astronaut. How freaking cool is that? It's Mark Garneau who was the first Canadian in space. From our first to our most recent astronauts, the world has been captivated by Canadians in orbit. With great humility and pleasure, I accept command of the International Space Station. Thank you, sir. Chris Hadfield connected the modern world to spaceflight. It was the first time the International Space Station was commanded by a Canadian. And I'm all set to operate Canada Arm 2. He's the guy who has essentially become, not just for Canada, but worldwide, the public face of humanity in space. On the battlefield, at international assemblies, and in zero gravity, Canadians prove to be leaders time and time again. It's just amazing to see in 150 years how far we've come from a colony to now a thriving independent nation that is well respected right around the world. We are one of the most successful countries in the world. We are one of the world's oldest democracies and we have now seized control of our destiny and it's up to us to write the next chapter. Let's learn from and be inspired by our history. Canada is an incredible nation, one we should all embrace. As we look toward the future, let's make history all Canadians and the world can be proud of.